I guess my first thought today is just to say welcome back, stranger. And <laughs> then to, uh, he was on a walkabout, you know, down there with the, with the kangaroos. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I just want to make a couple of announcements. We have a couple of prayer requests. I sent out those on the, on the email updates and stuff, but uh, uh, we have not, we, there may be some folks who have not received the emails, and that's one, the first one's Brenda's mom. She fell Thursday, yeah, Thursday evening, and broke her hip and and shoulder. We don't know if she fell or her hip broke and caused her to fall and break her shoulder or whatever. But she had surgery yesterday, and I think all is is pretty good right now. Okay, best it can be anyway. And praise God. Anyway, and then we have Pam Hendrickson, who, um, <laughs> we'll take care of that. Anyway, we have Pam Hendrickson, who, who's in the hospital over in Harker Heights, and she is, uh, she got a virus, one of the viruses that's going around that went, around, went to her heart, and, uh, she built up fluid around her heart, and, uh, she, I talked to her this morning, and she's doing a lot better. They put her on antibiotics. That's first, she went to the hospital last Monday or something, or Sunday or Monday. She was real bad sick, couldn't hardly breathe, and and they said she had pleurisy, you know, which is uh, some kind of buildup in the lungs or around the lungs or something. I, it has something to. I'm not real sure. Nick can probably explain it better than I can, but. Um, she, and they didn't do anything but give her cough medicine when she left the hospital. So, so she went home and it just it get, kept getting worse and worse. She finally went to the hospital and they said she'd gotten a virus and it it had built up around her heart or attacked her heart, the lining around her heart or something. I don't know how that works. I'm definitely not a medical person, but it sounded pretty serious to me. So. So um, please keep her in your prayers as well. But she, like I said, I talked to her this morning. She's doing a lot better. And they said if if she had a CAT scan, if it comes back positive uh, or comes back negative or whatever, however you say, I don't know which way is negative, which way is positive. One's good, which one's bad, you know. But but if it comes back good, then she's going to be able to go home this afternoon. So so keep her in your prayers as well. Uh, Frank's down in Florida, and uh, he he did the Bible study the other night. And we had some problems with it uh, recording on the in the archives. What happens is whenever we do a recording like we're doing today, we do it live, but it also automatically feeds to a server somewhere out there in the cloud, and uh, it. Uh, it, it stays there as a recording, and I can download it, and I can chop it up like I do a regular disc or what. Actually, it's, it's a lot easier than taking a disc home and doing it, but I can do Austin's or anybody else's, wherever they broadcast, if I want to pick it up. <coughs> and I talk, and so we had problems with it, so I called the guy yesterday, or the people yesterday that, that do our, our service, our streaming service, and while in the... In the uh, uh, duration that I was talking to him, he mentioned that, well, we can do some upgrades and stuff. So they they did some upgrades on the site, so you'll see a little bit of difference. If you're looking at the uh, the web page right now, viewing the service, you'll see it looks a little bit different. And one of the things that they did, if you turn your, if you turn it on, you're sitting there watching, we haven't started yet. If you have it just sitting there, the window, once we start, it'll automatically kick on. You don't have to sit there and refresh it. It's supposedly, that's what they say it's going to do. And that's one thing. One of the other things is we're going to be able to get, they're working on this right now, and they said it's not too off, far off in the future, is we're going to get real-time video information. And what that means is, is we'll be sitting, if, if while we're broadcasting, if somebody's up here speaking like Nick or Ray, I can go back there, sit down in the computer, bring up that program, look and see who and what city is watching, not who, but how many in what city, uh, how many's watching at one time, if they're watching from a different country or whatever. I can get some of that information now, but I get it after the fact. I don't get it while it's real time, but we'll be able to get all this information in real time so we'll have an idea of who is watching and where and how many. 
And so I think that's going to be great. But there, there's some other things coming down the road, too. And uh, those are just a couple, and I thought I'd just bring everybody up to date on what's going on. All right, my sermon today is probably going to take about two sermons, so I named this one Part One. <laughs> that's not the name of the sermon, that's the extension of it. It's called Exodus Again, and uh, Part One. And uh, we've been going through, we, went, we just completed going through Genesis here not too long ago during the Bible study, and, and we started going through Exodus, and we went through the first 12 chapters and you know when you get to chapter 12 it it's all about the uh, Passover and 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 God instituting that and then death angel coming down and you putting the door blood on the doorpost and all that all those things and uh, but up to that as we were reading through that it just we were discussing it and stuff and it you you just see so many similarities to our end time uh, uh, when Christ returns. And there's just so many parallels there that it, it, to me it's just striking as, as, to, as to the comparison of future events that are going to happen and what happened in Exodus 12. And what I'm going to do in these two sermons, I'm going to try to outline and show those parallels as best I can. But what I have to do first is give you some basic information and set up my, my sermons and stuff. And, uh, uh, and that's what I thought I'd do with this sermon is just kind of set everything up. And, uh, but as the events transpired in Exodus, as they, as they went along from all the way from the beginning when Moses started out to the point where they came out of Egypt, even on to the point where they crossed over the Jordan into the Promised Land, parallel so much as to what we see in Scripture as the end time events. So where, where we're going to start first is we're going to actually start in Genesis uh, 15, verse uh, 13, because this is, this is a promise from God to Abraham, and it's a promise to his people. And the first question you got to ask was, what was the Exodus about? What was the core reason that we have the Exodus? Now, there are many reasons. There's, you, can, you can name off several reasons as to why God may have wanted the exodus. But we're, what we're going to be looking for is, is, one, is possibly the core reason as to why it occurred. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 13, this is where God is talking to Abraham. And he said to Abram, well, it's Abram at this point. He hadn't changed his name yet. He says, uh, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. Now this is where he starts out and he tells Abraham, he says, he says, your descendants are going to go into this land and they're going to be kept there as slaves for 430 years. So he gives us a, a, a uh, uh, t well, he says 400 years here, but they actually were there 430 years. So he tells him, he says, this is what's going to happen to your descendants. And he says, and also a nation whom they serve, I will judge afterwards. They will come out with great possessions. And then he says, I'm going to bring them out. And he's telling Abraham, these events are going to happen to your descendants. He says, now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And what he's talking about here, the iniquity of the Amorites, when the Israelites came out of Egypt and they were going through the desert, the Amorites kept ambushing the, the rear guard, so to speak, of, of, of the, uh, the Israelites as they were moving through, through the lands. And they were very deceitful and very... Um, unhonorable about about how they did things. And it says, It came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there would appear a smoking oven and a burning torch. It passed between those pieces. Uh, and on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. So he makes this covenant with Abraham. This is the beginning of it. He says, I'm going to make this covenant. And then we kind of came in on the tail end of, of, of Christ coming up to uh Abraham and beginning this because I wanted to get to where he talked about the covenant. He says, On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, 
To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. Now here's, here's an interesting note, if you hadn't caught it yourself already. The first thing he tells Abram is your descendants are going into captivity for 400 years. Then he comes down here with this covenant. He says, now I'm going to give them all this land. Well, when? How? Where? They're going to be in, they're going to be in captivity. How are they going to, to inherit this land? Have they inherited it today? No, they have not. They have not inherited everything that God promised Abram at this time. That has not happened. They never did. They got a what? They got, if you look at the physical land of Israel over there today, well, they got a little stretch of land over there that goes along the Mediterranean Sea. At, at the, Israel's highest point of, of, of a nation, they went over slightly into uh, Jordan. Their borders went over to that area. They went up to about the middle of Syria, back down into the Sinai and stuff. But that, that still, in comparison to other nations, wasn't very big. And that was probably during Solomon's time. They never have uh, inherited the land that is being promised here. And he says the Canaanites, and he goes on and he talks about the borders, and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gezerites and Jezebites. And so, and if you'll turn over to 17.2, it talks a little bit more about this <coughs> in a different encounter here. He says, when Abram was 99 years old and the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. Yet we looked over there earlier and he talked about them going in. This, this had to be going into captivity and this had to be going through Abraham's mind as so. What in the world's going on here? And he says, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations, for everlasting covenant, to be God to your, uh, your descendants after you. Also, I will give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are stranger, all the land of Canaan, as everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every child among you shall be circumcised. And he goes into circumcision. He talks about circumcision here. And he says, he says, this is a sign. This is a sign between you and me. Now, if you go through the ten tenets of being of, of, of a covenant, of a blood covenant, there are certain things that happens during a blood covenant. One of the things is, is you make a physical sign on yourself. Now, the Indians in the Old West used to make a, remember the old blood brother thing? You cut themselves on the head. You see that in the Old Westerns. They say, oh, blood brother. And they grab each other's hands and they say, well, we're mixing blood. Well, what they, what, what they would do, and this, this, this is best noted in, in Stanley and Livingston, when Stanley was going through the, uh, through the, uh, the jungles down there, and he would meet a tribe of Indians or, or natives down there, and he would, he would uh, uh, make a covenant with them. And what he would do is he would make a mark on his arm, and they would take ashes, and they would rub in these ashes in, into the mark, and that mark would stay there permanently. It's kind of like a tattoo. Well, they said by the time he got to the other end of the, of the continent, he had like 70 or 80 marks on his arm, and any time he walked up to a, to a new tribe of, in, uh, of natives that would come out, he would just raise his arm, and they would, oh, let's make a covenant with this guy. Because what this meant is... And it meant the same thing back here. Anytime you make a covenant and you have a physical mark of that covenant on you, that person that you are in covenant with is, is there is an ally, as a brother, as sworn to help you, sworn to protect you, sworn to, to be there in your time of need, and you also would do these things for them. So when, when he walked up and he had all these marks on his arm and, they, and another tribe saw all those marks, they go, Oh my goodness, I got 50 tribes that I'm going to have to deal with if I mess with this guy. 
You see how that works? So he was able to, by the time he got to the end, he was able to basically, basically go anywhere he wanted to in Africa at that time because he had all of these covenants that he had built up between these tribes. And so Christ is telling Abraham, by doing circumcision, I have given you protection. I have given you my protection. You are in covenant with me. I am sworn to protect you. It's just like Virginia and I are in a covenant. And we are, I am sworn to protect her. Now, if somebody comes after me with a gun, she'll probably take off the opposite direction. No, I'm just kidding. But you see how that works. Husband and wife, sir, they become one. You become one with God. You become one with the one that you've made covenant with. And that is a physical mark that shows that mark. Now, today we have that mark, but not it, it's not so much a physical mark. It's a physical mark that God can see in our spirit. And it's a law also that we have that mark. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, he says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and, and that you may live. And that, and that kind of relates to one of the great commandments that when they asked Jesus, which was the greatest of the commandments, he says the first of the greatest commandments is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And I'm just paraphrasing that, so if I didn't say it correctly, don't jump on me. But anyway, <clears throat> but he says this is, God is going to circumcise your heart. You've got to, and, and, it, and, and it has to be in the Old Covenant, or the Old Testament, or part of the Old Covenant, before it can be in the New Covenant. So when we look in Romans chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 28, we see this reiterated by Paul. In verse 28 of Romans, he says, For it is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Because what's the first thing people think about when they think about circumcision? Jews. Well, it didn't begin with Jews. It began with Abraham. And people don't, for some reason, they can't associate that. They can't, they can't make a distinction, or I should say, uh, between circumcision in Abraham. They make the distinction between circumcision and Jews. But Paul's saying, okay, you think it's Jews, fine. He says, if you are a Jew, he says, if you're going to believe in God, then you are a Jew inwardly, and you are circumcised. He says, circumcision that is outward in the flesh, he says, that's, that's not what makes a Jew. He says, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in spirit, not in the letter, who praises not from men, but from God. So when people come up and ask me, why do you follow the Jews? And I had that question thrown at me here not too long ago. And it's not that I follow the Jews, I follow God. Now it may look Jewish, what you consider in your mind as being Jewish, but it belongs to God. These things belong to him. He first gave this to Abraham as a covenant. That is a show of our bond between Christ and us, and that we are his people. And it transcends time and space, and it transcends nationalities, because God is not a respecter of men. And we got to get that straight in our minds or we'll never be able to see what God is offering us. But his, Israel had to become a nation. They had to become a nation. So these are the instructions that God gave Israel. And he said, and Israel had to be circumcised, not Judah itself. Judah is part of Israel. Israel is not Judah by itself. That's like Texas is a part of America. America, Americans are not Texans. Not all of them. <laughs> just the ones in Texas. No, I'm just kidding. 
But no, you see what I'm saying? Not all Americans are Texans, but all Texans are Americans. That's a better way of saying it. And that's a better way of saying it, of looking at this. So when we look at this and we understand what God is telling Abraham and we look through the scriptures and we go through Genesis and we see, I'm not going to go through all the scriptures as where they actually went into captivity with Joseph and all of them. They actually went in with about 120 people. That was kinfolks and, and servants and different things like that. So when they first went to, into Egypt, 120. That's, that doesn't seem like a whole lot of people when you stop and consider when they came out 430 years later, there was 600,000 head of households that came in. 600,000 head of household. That's usually males, the lead male in the house. And you stop and extrapolate from that, that that there was a wife and probably on average two children. We figured there was probably something like three million that came out of Israel at that time. And I, I've always had it in the back of my, my head there was more than that. Because I can't, you might say there was an average of two people per, or two children per household today, but not then. Those people were prolific in their childbearing. They didn't have the, the uh, uh, stuff that we have today that keeps women from getting pregnant. They got pregnant a lot and often. And, uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll go with that figure. We'll say three million. You say, well, how do you get three million people out of 120 in 430 years? Well, let me do a little uh, do a little experiment. I did this at home when I was preparing this sermon. Take 120 and double it every 20 years, and that's conservative. Double it every 20 years. When you get to about 17 times, you have 1.9 million people on this earth. So that is 17 times. You're not. You're about two thirds of the way through maybe three quarters of the way through. So if you double that again, you're already there. So it doesn't take very long to, to get a few million people, of very many generations. And they grew into a people. They grew into a people that God chose and God told Abraham, promised Abraham that was going to happen. And they were in Egypt for 430 years. And he chose Israel because he said he loved Israel. Well, if you and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. <clears throat> you say, well, why would God, why on earth would God put, put Israel in a situation like that? Did, was he punishing them? Did he, did they do something? Did they, did they, did they break his law in order for them to, to wind up in, in Egypt for that amount of time into slavery and so forth? Well, let's, let's look and see what God said about it. In Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 7, verse 6, he says, For you are a holy people. God said you are a holy people. The physical nation of Israel. He said you are a holy people. He said, and what holy means is set aside. He set them aside for his purpose. And the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. He has chosen you to, for a specific reason. A special treasure above all peoples on the face of the earth. And you say, wow. So he stuck them in Egypt. <laughs> Sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? Sounds kind of, kind of funny. He said, The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. He made a nation of them. He made Israel who Israel was. And we can look back and we can see where Jacob was the one where the, where the name change occurred in Genesis 35 verse 9. And, and uh, Jacob was coming back with Leah and his family and his goats and stuff that he had got from uh, uh, Laban. And, uh, and he was on his way back to see his brother, whom he was afraid of, uh, because he had, he had stole his birthright. 
And, uh, and in that process going back, he, uh, thanks, Ray. He, he got into this wrestling match with the angel, which turned out to be Christ. And uh, he got his hip thrown out of socket. For now, for that reason, we can't eat the the uh, hindquarters of a cow anymore, or they can't. I will, but that's where they get that from. And he he told him, and he made a covenant with Jacob at that time. And he says, "Your name will no longer be Jacob." He says, "You will be called Israel." And that's where Israel first came. Now you say, "Well, where did the name Israel come from?" Well, despite what it actually means, to str- I think it means struggle with or, or to struggle with God. But despite what its meaning, Israel is a name of God. You say, well, why would he give him his name? Well, that's another tenet of one of the tenets of, co- of, of making a blood covenant between people is you will give or take on that person's name. When Virginia and I once more went into covenant with one another, she took on my name, my last name. When Charlotte and Tony got married here and they they went and made a covenant with one another, she took on his last name. That is part of the tenets. Well, whenever uh, it, uh, Jacob went into covenant with God, he took on one of God's name or part of his name, and that was Israel. And he carries that name, and his children will carry that name. And, and so forth. Just like a husband's wife and children will carry on their name. So it's not unusual. But he loved Israel, he said. His Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were the more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all people. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep an oath which he swore... To your fathers, and the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And he, he talks more about that, but this is, this is his purpose for Israel, because he chose them. And we are chosen for the same sake of love today. You say, well, that was Israel then. Well, I just showed you in in, in Romans where he said if you are a Jew or you love God or you're part of God, you're circumcised inwardly and you are a Jew inwardly. Well, what is a Jew? A Jew is an Israelite. So you have taken on God's name when you go into covenant with God. You take on his name. You take on his promises that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you become part of his inheritance. It's more of a spiritual thing today. It's not something that we can say, we can walk around and say, well, I'm Israelite. You probably could, but people would look at you real strange and say, well, speak Hebrew. Well, I can't do that. <laughs> In John chapter 14, 15, you don't have to turn there. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's part of the thing that another tenet of, of making a covenant with somebody is you agree to the tenets. That is laid out in law. They agreed to the laws that stipulate how a marriage is today and so forth. Covenants are covenants. They haven't changed much in the last three or four thousand years. They are all basically the same. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9, He says this. He says, Who has saved us, called us with a holy calling. You see, now we have that holy calling, he said. He said, we're part of that. The same that we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 7 applies to us today. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. And grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Now they see the grace and 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 uh, that that and that stuff and purpose, but they don't see in Jesus before time began. That people don't see that. They say, "Well, I'm saved by grace. That's all I need." Well, if it began before time. 
then that would include up to this point the laws, the first five books of the Bible, because they were in between that time and today. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life, immortality to light through the gospel. He brought it, he expressed it, he showed us his purpose. Not because of anything we've done, like he said here. They were chosen for a purpose and so were, so were we. God put them in Egypt as we are in Egypt today. We are in a spiritual Egypt today. And Christ will destroy them in the future or destroy Egypt in the future as he did then. And as we look in Isaiah chapter 19, we get a good, look, good glimpse of what's going to happen. Isaiah chapter 19. Like I said, he destroyed Egypt then, and we'll get into some of the particulars in the next sermon. He says, the burden against Egypt. And this is a... And he specifically uses the term Egypt. He, see, he says, Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud. Now, when is this going to happen? We know of one event when the time comes when it says Christ will come in clouds. So, and that is at his coming. And will come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt will totter at his presence. Now, the idols of Egypt will totter, totter at his presence. When we go back and we look at the first books, or, the, or like the, the first 11 chapters of whatever, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, of Exodus, prior to Exodus 12, and we see where the ten plagues occurred, we see that God was specifically picking out Egypt's gods, their main gods, and attacking them and destroying them. Because what he was doing, he was taking their belief system away from them. He was taking their 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 homage and their 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 thoughts and their prayers and everything else. He was attacking everything that they had in their society that they had wrapped up in these gods, and he was destroying that. And the reason being is he wants the world to rely upon him. And this was as much for Israel's part at that time as it was for Egypt to see that he was God. And even Pharaoh recognized who God was at, that, at one point. But he says, I'm going to destroy the idols of Egypt at the end time just as I had destroyed them in, in Egypt of old. So we see a parallel what God said he's going to do here. And he says, and the heart of Egypt will melt in its midst. And boy, if you read the accounts of what happened, some of their historical accounts that they have, the Egyptians wrote afterwards about what happened there, and, and, and not only the Bible, but some of the other first-hand accounts of some of the people that were there and wrote about the land at that time. So that land was in utter destruction. It was like an atomic bomb had gone off in that land. I mean, it, he literally annihilated. And I, and I was talking to Frank about it, and I said... You know, it's interesting because one of the things that we do is we look at prophecy and we see what's going to happen at the end time. And we see what, what the scriptures tell us, that at the end time, according to Ezekiel, there's probably going to be a tenth, only a tenth of live people that actually go into the millennium. And I wonder, and this is just me wondering, okay, this is, you don't have to quote this as fact or anything like that, please don't, but this is just me wondering because I can't prove it anyway. But in, but in the end time, just as a tenth goes into the, in the millennium, if there wasn't just a tenth of Israel left, besides the Exodus, whenever they left, because there was a lot of people that were killed. When you stop and think about firstborn, you stop and, th stop and think about the hail that fell and, and all these things and the starvation that occurred, because there was no food. It didn't matter how much gold you had. It didn't matter how much money you had. There was very little water. There was very little food. There was very little livestock. The destruction of that nation was complete. And there was no wonder why many Egyptians went with Israel when they left Egypt at that time. 
And he says, and the heart of Egypt will melt in its midst. Well, the heart of this, this land will melt in the presence of Christ coming. Well, he even says, I think it's in uh, Malachi, I believe it is, where he says that the eyes of those will melt. You know, I, I, it's a physical description of them melting. Yeah, huh? Zechariah, yeah. So, the, the whole world, we know, and we talked about this in so many sermons, about the world just, just being obliterated by Christ when he comes and said Christ's robe will be drenched in blood. Well, he's, he's going to be in the form of the angel, the death angel, coming back to this world. And people say, well, that's not Christ. Well, yeah, but it is. Because he's going to bring justice back to this world. First and foremost. And that's what he was bringing to Egypt. Egypt it was a form of the world at that time. They were the leading nation at that time. They were the America of that time. They were the great social platform, the great social society of their day. God says, I don't care how great you are, what kind of weapons you got, how many gods you have, I can take care of you. He created us. He made us. He made the atom. He knew it could be split and made, a, and made into a bomb. And he knows how to deal with it. But he goes on to say in verse 2, he says, I will set Egyptians against Egyptians. We see that today. The Egyptians are fighting each other. <coughs> he says, everyone will fight against his brother. But let, a little side note, let me back up to that one last verse. What are Egyptians today? If we're spiritual Israel... And we're waiting for the death angel. We're waiting for Christ. We're waiting for our salvation. We're waiting for Moses, so to speak, to lead us out. Who are the Egyptians today? Spiritually. It's the world. It is the world. And we'll get into that a little bit more. He says... And everyone against his neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. And see, it, that, that just reinforces my point because Egypt is one kingdom. And when he says kingdom against kingdom, he's talking about multiple kingdoms. He says, the spirit of Egypt will fail in its midst, and I will destroy their counsel, and they will consult the idols and charmers. Instead of turning toward God, they will turn toward their gods... And ask for salvation. And that's why God continually attacked Egypt's uh, gods. Because every time he would bring a plague on, they would turn to one of their other gods and they would say, Oh, muck or whatever. There was a couple of them. <laughs> they had some weird names and they would say, Save us. Well, they couldn't save them. Stone and wood can't save you. Gold and silver Trinkets can't save you. Kneeling 50 times in a worship service ain't, isn't going to save you. Repetitive prayers won't save you. Only your belief in God. Your true belief in God. Your true willingness to believe what He says. And that might not save you physically. It didn't save hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of Jewish people in the, in, the re, in the revolts in the 70 A.D. when Jerusalem was sacked and destroyed in the temple. They said as many as 500,000 Jews were hung up on crosses and, and uh, smeared with pitch and tomb and, and lit on fire. It said the night glowed with them burning. Many of them, many of them were Christians, followers of Christ. But it will save you spiritually. 
He says, I will destroy their counsel. And they will consult the idols and charmers, the mediums and sorcerers. That sounds like what our nation would do today when Christ comes back. We see in Revelation 6 where an Antichrist comes back first and he deceives the people. And what are the people going to do? They're going to bow down. They're going to go, they're going to, go to their eastern cultures. They're going to go to all these other, other people who claim to be, be prophets and ambassadors of Christ and vicars of Christ and that sort. And they're going to say, oh, save us. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And the Egyptians I will give into the hand of a cruel master. And the fierce king will rule over them, says the Lord, the Lord of hosts. The waters will fail from the sea and the river will be wasted and dried up. The rivers will turn foul. And that's exactly what happened in Egypt. The first thing he did was turn the rivers to blood. Destroyed the rivers. The, the river, the life-giving river of Egypt was Nile. They depended upon it for their food, their water, and everything else. And he, and he destroyed it. He turned it to blood. And the brooks of defense will be emptied and dried up, and the reeds and the rushes will wither, and the papyrus reeds by the river of the mouth of the river, and everything sown by the river will wither Will, will wither and be driven away and be no more. And the fishermen also will mourn because the fish are dead. They're flopping on the beaches. They're, they're floating on top of the water because they can't breathe in that stuff. All those will lament who cast hooks into the river and they will languish who spread nets on the water. Moreover, those who work in fine flax and those who weave fine fab fabric will be ashamed. And he's talking about just the mere instance of one plague upon this world will cause so much chaos that it will affect, it'll have a, a, an effect like a domino. And it'll affect everything that, it had, that it's connected to it and everything that's connected to that and everything that's connected to that will suffer. And its foundations will be broken, and, and all who make wages will be troubled of soul. Surely the princes of Zion are fools, or Zorn, I'm sorry. Zorn are fools. Pharaoh's wife counsels give foolish counsel. How do you say to Pharaoh, I am the son of wise and the son of ancient kings? Your positions, your, your kingships, the things that you know, the, the preachers, the, the governments and stuff, they won't have answers for these things. They didn't have answers then, they won't have answers now because they cannot, they cannot fight God's hand. He says, the son of ancient kings, where are they? Where are your wise men? Let them tell you now and let them know what the Lord of hosts has purposed against Egypt. You know, they can't tell us. They can't, men, men can't tell us. How to succeed. Only God can. God gave us the words that we needed and the ways we needed to follow in order to be a fruitful people in this world and to have peace with our neighbors and stuff. And we reject it. We reject it outright. Oh, yeah, people say every home in this, in this country probably got a Bible in it, except for maybe an atheist or two. But they probably got one stashed somewhere. But they reject it. You can talk to people all day long about the Sabbath. You can talk to people all day long about the Holy Days. You can talk to them about all these things that are just jump out at you in the pages. Tells you to do those things, to observe those things. And you can search all day, on the other hand, looking for Christmas and all these other things that are traditions of men, and you can't find them. Yet that's what they'll turn to. They'll turn to the wisdom of man, the traditions of man. And they'll keep turning to them until Christ comes back and sets it straight. He says the princes of Zoan have become fools. The princes of Noph are deceived. And they have also deluded Egypt. Those who are the ma uh, mainstay of its tribes. And the Lord has mingled a, a perverse spirit in her midst. 
Boy, this just describes the United States to a T today. We have a perverse spirit, spiritual condition in our country today. Where everything is up, is supposed to be up, is down, and everything that's supposed to be down is up. And they have caused Egypt to err in all her work, and a drunken man staggers in his vomit. Neither will there be any work for Egypt, which the head or the tail, the palm or the branch or the bulrush may do. In that day, Egypt will be like a woman and will be afraid and fear because of the wavering, the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he waves over it. And the land of Judah will be a terror to Egypt. Everyone who makes mention of it will be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he has determined against it. In that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear by the Lord of hosts, one will be called the city of destruction. And in that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord of its, at its borders. And it will be for a sign, for a witness to the to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of the oppressors, and he will send them a Savior, a mighty one, and he will deliver them. Who is that sign? Who is, who is that pillar in the land of Egypt? Who is that altar? Well, we can go back in, 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 second, in second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. He says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has a righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and, and what accord has Christ with Biela, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever, and what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And he tells us, verse 17, he says, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be the father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. But we are that. We are the temple of God. The temple, the physical temple has been destroyed for 2,000 years. We're the temple of God now. Where does the altar live? The altar lives in us. We are that witness. We are that sign. And we are waiting on a Savior, a mighty one, and he will deliver us. Then the Lord will be known to Egypt and the Egyptians will know, verse 21, the Lord in that day will make a sacrifice and offering. Yes, he will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. I'm back in uh, Isaiah 19, verse 21. Sorry, I moved back over there. And the Lord will strike Egypt and will strike the hill of it and will return to the Lord and he will be entreated by them and heal them. And in that day there will be a highway to Egypt, to Assyria. And the Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into the Assyrians and the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. And in that day Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the land whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt. My people in Assyria, the work of my hands, and in Israel, my inheritance. You said, wow, when will that happen? Here he is destroying Egypt. Here he is destroying this nation. And then all of a sudden, it's going to be one of, one of three that God blesses? Well, we can get a hint. Turn to Zechariah chapter 14. This is millennial. Start in verse 14, 16. Zechariah 14, verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to keep the feast of tabernacle. This is millennium. This is time after Christ has come. And he's back on earth. 
And it shall be that whichever the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. And if the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague which the Lord strikes a nation who do not come up and keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the feast of tabernacles. But they will. Who wouldn't? You've got Christ as your high priest on this earth. There will be no other religions on this earth. And he says, I will call them my people. They will be my sons and daughters. That's what the Father says. says, you are my sons and daughters. And we just read that in 2 Corinthians. There will be a time we will be his people. We, we are his people today. We have his spirit. And you know... Here's something to stop and consider. He says, I'm going to call them my people. But let's turn to Ezekiel, and then I'll make this comment. Turn to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37, verse 15. Because I want you to consider this, and I want this to go deep into your mind. He says, again, the word of the Lord came to me, son, saying, as for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it, for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, and take another stick and write on it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel's companion. And I believe the nation, United States of America, is the proverbial nation of Ephraim in, in Scripture, in prophecy. That's just me. I believe it. I know some think it's Manasseh, but I believe it's Ephraim because you see Ephraim too many times in prophecy. For all the house of Israel's companions, then join them one another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. Then, and when the people, and when the children of your people speak to you, saying, "Will you not show us what you mean by these?" Say to them, "Thus says the Lord God: Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim." And the tribes of, of Israel, his companions, and I will join with them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be in my hand. And up until this current president, we were always one with Israel. We were always one stick, and to a point we still are today. We are probably one of our strongest allies is Israel. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I will surely take the children of Israel from among the nations, whether they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be over them, them all. And they shall no longer be two nations, for they nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. And they shall not defile themselves any more with idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them all from their dwelling places, which they have sinned, and will cleanse them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. He says, I will be their God. Now I'm going to ask you this question. We read that, and we've read in Second Corinthians where he told us that he will become a father to us to the sons and, and to the daughters. Do you think God's going to put His Holy Spirit in a stranger's body? Into a total stranger who's, who's not willing to obey Him, not willing to follow Him, not willing to, to adhere to his, to his request, demands, or anything of that sort? Do you think He's going to put His Holy Spirit in it? No, He's not. You must first belong to Him. You must first be identified as Israel. Spiritually. He chose us and He will cleanse us. He will teach us and He will guide us in His way as He did to the nation of Israel in Sinai. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, do not want you to be unaware that all your fathers were under the cloud, 
all pass through the sea. And this is Paul telling, telling these, these folks, he said, this is what I want you to know. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. And he's talking about the physical nation of Israel and the Sinai. When they left Egypt, and he said Christ was with them. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also have lusted. So he taught them. He looked at them. He says, he says I'm going to teach them. I'm going to show them what they need to know. And we can look back and we see Christ in the presence of Israel, but we, we can't see and we can't seem to see him today as a nation. Out of the millions that came out with Moses in the original Exodus, only a few crossed over into the Promised Land. They all died in the desert. They all died in the desert. I think it was everyone under 19 at that time. Everyone over that age except for, for uh, Caleb and Joshua, thank you, were the only ones who did not, that crossed over into the, into the promised land. Everyone else perished in the desert. God's serious. Jesus Christ is serious. That was Christ. And they perished because they were unbelievers. Christ was right there in front of them in a pillar of fire by night and a cloud, a pillar of smoke in the daytime, standing at the entrance of the tent, talk to Moses, give him his law, his judgments, his decisions. And they did not believe. They rebelled. They did everything they could but follow God. People say, well, if we saw that today, well, I'd be a believer. No, they wouldn't. No, they wouldn't. Because that's what humans, humans are naturally rebellious. Only a remnant went into the promised land because of unbelief. And we've read where the world would be destroyed, and just as in ancient Egypt was then, so will be the day off in the future. Only a remnant will be saved. If we could put our fingers on what, what our main gods are today that annoy Christ and God the Father, I know some of them, but if we could put our fingers on them, we could almost know what he's going to attack and on his return or he's going to destroy because I believe he's going to destroy the gods of men at his return he's going to destroy our capitalism he's going to destroy our money system he's going to destroy the religious systems of today he's going to destroy all the things that we hold dear as a nation and and for what purpose So that we will hold fast to him. We will look at him, we will recognize him, and we will say, hey, this is God. Even the Pharaoh at one point stood up and said, this is God. But God hardened his heart and he kept on going. Well, in Matthew 24, if we look at that scripture again, And we see some of the things that are going on there. Verse 3, he says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things will be. And he talked about the destruction of the temple. And he says, 
And what sign will be your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed, no one deceives you. That's the first thing he said. Take heed, no one deceives you. Well, when you look at ancient Egypt, they had the, the, the sorcerers, the enchanters, and the government, and everybody out there saying, eh, we've got people who can do those tricks. We've got people who can do that kind of stuff. And they deceived the people. And we got people today who's saying, why don't you follow the Jews? Why don't you do what they do? <laughs> well, wait a minute. I'm not following the Jews. I'm following Christ. Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and will deceive many. And we see day after day, time after time, Sunday after Sunday, people stand up there and say, God doesn't matter anymore. His law is done away. You know, all you have to do is believe. That's not what he said. And he says, and you will hear of wars and rumor of wars and see that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass and the end is not yet. Yeah, we'll, we see them quite a bit going on today. And he said, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. And it sounds almost it just parallel what we saw in Isaiah 19, what he was talking about there with Egypt. And they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and be hated for my name and for for uh, all nations for my name's sake. And and that's right. It's not a happy time in the end time for God's people, but it never has been. They've been persecuted if you read Fox's book Martyr, they've been persecuted since Christ's death. And then many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. And we preach that gospel to all the nations of the earth today. It's being preached right now. What I just said went to every nation on this earth. And he goes on to say, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet stay, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And they say, well, the Jews are expecting to build the new temple over in Jerusalem. And they think they have to build that temple before Christ can come. And they have all the accoutrements that the temple had back then. They have the red heifer. They are, they're ready to go. They have identified the Levitical priesthood. They're sitting there ready to go. I think they're even doing sacrifices, daily sacrifices now. But they don't have the temple. But the temple that was in Shiloh, before the temple that was in Jerusalem, was a tent that God told Israel to build when they were in Sinai. And I believe that they will build another tent because that can be con constructed in a manner of days and could be, theoretically, put up in Shiloh. But I believe it will be set up in Jerusalem. Then let those who are in Judea flee the mountains, and let him who is in the housetops not go down for anything out of his house. And he goes on and he talks about other conditions that are going on at that time. And we can look back and we can see the presence of Israel but in, in, in the Sinai. And we can look here and we can see where Christ's presence will be here at the end time. And when we read this prophecy and we think of ancient Egypt and we see what happened in that time, we can see what God has intended or is intending for the end time. Christ destroyed their gods. He will do it again. He will destroy the gods of this world. And there will be nothing left to worship but Christ. And my last scripture for today, turn to Exodus chapter 7. Verse 
verse 1. <clears throat> he says, So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. There are several things that we are taught to look for prior to Christ's coming. And he said, Moses is a form of God to Pharaoh. And he said, there will be a prophet. And we're told of Malachi that, that we have one like Elijah that comes before Christ. And Elijah was a prophet. Now, I don't know if there will be another one in the form of Elijah before the end time or John was that Elijah that he spoke about. But we do know that there's two witnesses coming. And we see Aaron and we see Moses. Now, I don't, I'm not saying they're the two witnesses, okay, but they are a form of those witnesses. But we have the parallel once more. And he says, you shall speak what I command you. And the witnesses, what they do when they come, they will give witness to God and His word, His truth. And they will do this for three and a half years. And Aaron, your brother, shall tell the Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. It makes me wonder what that message will be. It really does. When I look at these parallels, it makes me wonder what that message is. I know what part of it will be. Repent. And follow God's truth. Follow the truth. But, I don't know. You know, the Pharaoh was a form of Satan. Moses is a form of God. We have all the players in the Exodus that we're going to have at the end time. And Satan has all the pagan gods just as he had when Pharaoh was on this earth. And Christ will come and destroy those gods. What are some of those gods? Well, you can pick them out. Hollywood. I mentioned some of them. Environmentalism. I mean, personally, I can't wait to see Hollywood go, but anyway. <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> yeah, Vegas. You know, some of those things. But that's the end of part one. And we'll get into some of that stuff in part two.